Happy Friday. Um, so thank you all so much for coming to our spring legislative breakfast. My name is Stacy Keevy. I am the president and CEO for the Heart of Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce. And I would first just like to introduce my team. So in back here, you'll see Promise Bakken. Wave. She is the Marketing and Communications Director. And I have Laura Bonner Ridgeway, Workforce and Community Development Director. Holly Ann Heidel, Office Manager. And then Lacey Alling, Events and Engagement Director. And I would also like to give a big shout out for our sponsors for today's event. Enbridge, Domtar, Ho-Chunk Gaming Nakusa, Mid-State Technical College, U.S. Bank, and J.H. Findorf and Sons. Yeah, big applause. <laughs> we would not be able to do these events without our sponsors. Um, please join me in welcoming our moderator for today's event, Craig Tim. Thank you and good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. Uh, beautiful weather. Beware the Ides of March. Isn't that today? If I remember my English. But to honor America and all of our veterans, if you would please rise and help me with let us take a uh, pledge to the uh, pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Those of you that have been here before kind of know how we're doing this. The nice thing is we have a full house. We have 55 people. That has to be one of the largest we've ever had. So there must be an election coming up. I'm not sure when that is. But um, we're going to do this in really two parts today. We're going to start with our uh, elected officials. I'm uh, going to ask them a few questions, and there's going to be lots of time for folks to just uh, uh, raise your hand and ask questions to the elected official. Then the, we're going to break for a couple seconds, not really break, but we're going to have anybody that is in the audience that is an elected official or running for an office, just to you know, just kind of uh, do a real quick uh, intro of yourself. And then, um, since we are in Wisconsin Rapids, we are going to call up our two candidates for the office of mayor, and they will kind of they will talk about their platforms, and then we'll have a chance to ask them questions also. So, again, I, we want to make this as informal as we can. We know that you have questions. Again, I, when I've talked to the elected officials, they have said if anyone wants to talk to them afterwards, they're certainly open for them. So. If you don't get your question asked, or if you have something, uh, except maybe Krug, he probably has a house to sell yet this morning, but we don't know that. A couple. A couple, okay. So, at this point, again, thank you so much for coming, and thank the Chamber, the Heart of Wisconsin. We just came off a great annual meeting, and then following up with this, so things are good in Chamber, chamber world here. So, if I could um, call up uh, Senator Patrick Testa, Representative Scott Krug, and Representative Donna Roser. You are requested up at the big table. Way over here. Way over here. Now they have to fight, and who know. sits next to who here? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I can you got back and forth. Yeah. Almost looks like somebody should say, yes, can I take your drink order for you on the high top? So we were thinking, uh, first of all, uh, we're going to have each... Uh, each elected official briefly introduce themselves, but we thought, uh, because there's been a lot of news out there about new districts, and uh, they might be, they may not even know exactly where their district is, but we're going to have them attempt to tell us where their new districts are. So. We know. <laughs> Let us start in the Senate, uh, District 24. Uh, welcome and good to have you, Pat Tesla. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Good morning. So, yeah, I, we have new districts. Did I miss something? Um, <laughs> at least he calls you. Yeah. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, State Senator Patrick Teston represents the 24th Senate District, which, uh, if anyone's been paying attention, it looks a little bit different than it did just a few weeks ago. 
So after um, the Supreme Court election, obviously the, the state Supreme Court, um, there was a lawsuit challenging the legislative maps. It got relitigated. I'm not going to go into the back and forth politics of it, but after long, long discussions on both houses, we ultimately made the decision that we were going to pass new legislative maps that the governor had proposed and that he signed into law, which basically threw out the, the lawsuit. And so now we have new maps moving forward at least until 2031. So the new 24th Senate District, um, uh, living in Portage County, uh, for the first time in probably 40 or 50 years, Portage County is split three ways between three Senate districts and four different assembly seats. So uh, my seat now comprises of the town of Hall, the city of Stevens Point, uh, Plover, and some other rural areas within the county. Moving over into Wood County, I now only represent uh, Wisconsin Rapids and South. So I lose communities like Pittsville, Vesper, Rudolph, and others. I got taken completely out of Washera County, pick up more of Adams County. Now represent the majority of Juneau County, so basically everything north of Elroy. Uh, lost the city of Sparta, Monroe County, and then basically have the eastern half of Monroe County, and then um, have all of Jackson County, so Black River Falls area. I previously represented a portion of Jackson County, but now that's the only whole county that I have. So i uh, going to be spending these next several months going to new areas of the district. I know Representative Krug and I are going to be down in Juneau County tomorrow meeting with folks. and. And uh, it'll be a fun, fun opportunity, and looking forward to uh, making new friends throughout the new 24th Senate District. Well, to say that we don't know where our new districts are would be a bit naive, because we have <laughs> really studied the maps. So I'm Donna Roser. I currently represent the 69th Assembly District, which has been portions of Wood County, Marathon County, Clark County and Jackson County. So I had Black River Falls before, and I went from Dorchester all the way down to Black River Falls. I live in Marshfield, and let me explain to what you what happened with my district. So Marshfield was put together. You guys might know that the two previous representatives, Scott Souter, lived in Abbotsford, and Bob Culp lived in Stratford. Well, when Bob Culp called me, uh, four years ago to see if I would be interested in running for his seat because he was not interested in seeking re-election. I guess nobody thought that there would now be two representatives that lived in Marshfield. So um, knowing that the person that um, represented the other district that took part of uh, Marshfield had stated that um, this was going to be my last term, this is going to be my last term, I really encouraged uh, people uh, the people that worked on the maps four years ago um, to put Marshfield together because it was very confusing to people to have two representatives that were in Marshfield. And the other representative had, a representative had expressed some uh, desire to not run again. Well, you know that we were close to a supermajority and nobody really wanted to lose to uh, representatives at that time, so Marshfield was not put together. Well, with the background that Senator Teston just uh, explained to you, Marshfield was put together in this new map. So I have been moved into a new realigned 86th Assembly District. So the realigned um, 86th Assembly District looks like this. 21% um, of the new district was Nancy Vandermeer's. And if you remember, Nancy Vandermeer had that middle portion of Wood County, including Pittsville and Vesper and Auburndale and Arpin and all of that, Rudolph. So they put that into the new realigned 86th Assembly District. So I guess now Wood County will just have two representatives because Representative Krug represents the uh, southern part of Wood County. So 21% um, of the new realigned 86th is Representative Vandermeer's. And then two years ago, I lost Edgar because I had had Edgar in the 69th and they took it away and gave it to Jimmy Boy and then this new realigned 86th brings Edgar back to the 86th, not the 69th, but the new realigned 86th. So um, that was 6% of, that is 6% of this new realigned district. 
48% of the new realigned 86th is my old 69th assembly district. So um, I, have, I have 48 of the geography. I got 6% back from Jimmy Boy, and then 25% of the new realigned 86th is, was in the old 86th Assembly District. So basically 54% of this new realigned 86th Assembly District is, uh, is people that I have represented before. A large portion I've done for four years and then I got the 6% back. So it, it didn't make any sense for me not to run again. I know that uh, it puts us in a difficult situation and I am not the only one that's been paired with someone who has served faithfully and well in the state assembly. It is a very awkward, uncomfortable, unfortunate situation. Um, I think somebody in our caucus said it sucks, if I remember that correctly. Yeah, I, I think it was Robin, but anyway, it, you know, it, it really is a very uncomfortable situation. But because I looked at the demographics, I looked at the situation, and when I ran four years ago, it was my desire to serve in the state assembly for um, eight or ten years, and so I have not been there yet. There are some things I want to get done. I think most of you all know that I was the assembly author of the postpartum bill, which would extend um, Medicaid, uh, ex uh, Medicaid, um, which is the word I'm looking for, uh, it would extend Medicaid to 365 days for women that have babies, uh, just not the 60 days. We could not get that through the assembly. It passed the Senate 32 to 1. I appreciate that, Senator Teston, your support. But uh, that's one thing I would like to keep working on. Um, many of you know that Senator Teston has been very involved in the nurse practitioner bill. I feel very strongly about nurse practitioners working independently. I had some major problems with that bill, but I would like to see a path forward to allow nurse practitioners to practice independently and help our uh, health care system. So there are some things that I would like to see moving forward. I don't know if some of you all know that I worked as a nurse practitioner back in the 70s. I was one of the first nurse practitioners practitioners to get their certification as a nurse. Uh, I loved being a nurse practitioner. Probably if my life hadn't changed a little bit, I would have continued to do that and been grandfather claused in. But I know nurse practitioners are an important part of healthcare delivery. So I'd like to be able to um, see that move forward. And so um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Oh, all right. Jeez. <laughs> Morning, Scott Crook, State Representative, 72nd Assembly District. This one's a really easy one to describe. So I had all, I had, mo I had Western Washera County all the way out to Red Granite. Take that, get rid of it, give me the same amount of land in Juneau County. So basically, the center of the district stays the same, which is the Wisconsin Rapids area. Uh, I do pick up Nakusa, which is really cool because I've had a Nakusa address for 10 years. Never represented the city of Nakusa. Uh, and I also pick up more of Southern uh, Wood County, so I go all the way up to Pittsville now. So I get Dexterville which is awesome, Babcock, which is really cool, because those are areas my family's from originally, so it's really nice to have those areas. I'm excited to have Juneau County back in the district, so it's basically Nacita all the way down to Camp Douglas. Uh, I was a sheriff's deputy over there in the 90s, and early 2000s, so it's gonna be really cool to reconnect with those folks. Uh, if you look at my district on the map, it encompasses both sides of Lake Petenwell and Castle Rock Lake, all the way down on both sides. I'm super excited about that. It is a great tourism district. We've worked on water issues in this in this realm for the last 12 years. Now I get the entirety of Pekinwell and Castle Rock on both sides and the issues that come with that. Uh, so it's gonna be, it's a fun situation to, to deal with on the backside. Getting there was not fun. Uh, it, was, it was an awful situation to have to try to figure out new maps two years after we figured out new maps, two years after we figured out new maps before that. We're finally done with the map stuff and I've said it from the beginning. The lines don't matter. It's the quality of the candidate. It's the message of the candidate. So we can run whatever lines we, you know, whatever lines we get, we're going to get. Uh, but in the end, the maps are not going to matter. So I will, I will cede the rest of the time here to get to questions. But that is what the new district is going to look like. So when you're sitting in the boat on Lake Dexter, you can honestly say that you're trying to engage yeah. with constituents. It is, yeah. So we're going to like take the boat. I'm going to put signs all around the boat so we can be up and down Castle Rock and Lake Dexter. And that, I mean. It is a water, water district, so that's going to be cool. Well, you might have an opponent coming up here. 
Don't say that. So, Come on. Anyway, <laughs> why don't since the, mic, it, since the mic is still over there, I know um, the session is concluded, but maybe if you could just give us a couple highlights that uh, you think or things that you're the most proud of that maybe came out of the last yeah, this I, year I, or even into, into last year too a little bit. Really easy. I, there's three areas. I was the chair of the campaign and the elections committee in the assembly of the session. That's what I'm most proud of is we. We're able to take all of the noise and all the anger and all the frustrations of the 2020 election, tamp it down a little bit. The previous chair of the committee really wanted to poke the bear and, and try to create controversy where there necessarily wasn't. Uh, so Donna's on the committee with me as well. So we worked really well with the Democrats on the committee and the governor's office. Actually get bills onto his desk that he could sign that's going to improve our election systems. Instead of just throwing things at the wall and hoping that they happen, and we actually worked together to figure out some pass forward to, to fix some timelines with some absentee ballot issues and you know some of the, the the real things that are wrong with our elections is that the perception of what's going on with our elections so I was super proud that our committee was working so well together this entire session uh, I think beyond just the policies we got through that committee I think we set a good example throughout the rest of the building that there is actually a new way forward that we can actually work together get some things done uh, not yell and scream and argue so much, not, not aim for press releases, not aim for getting notoriety. Uh, just, just put our nose down to the grindstone and get stuff done. Uh, beyond that was my first session on the local government committee because I'm also on the Adams County Board of Supervisors. Uh, and it, my first session here in local government was eye-opening uh, to help us figure out exactly what our communities need. So we passed a monumental bill that uh, it completely revamped our shared revenue system. So every municipality, every county, it's going to be able to keep more of the dollars that they send to Madison. It's common sense, right? If it came from here, it should stay here. Uh, that's what the goal of the Shared Revenue Bill did. It was a, a, another great bipartisan effort. And then finally, I'm on the Housing and Real Estate Committee because, you know, like Craig mentioned before, I've got houses to sell, so I'm going to talk fast and get out of here. Uh, but on, on the Housing and Real Estate Committee this session, we passed a, a half billion dollar package of bills uh, aimed at creating more inventory to help keep housing prices a little bit lower and the pressures in the market from causing people not be able to achieve the American dream of home, home, home ownership. Uh, so those bills that we passed through that committee, the $500 million, uh, the revamping of uh, upper units on main streets throughout the state of Wisconsin, uh, you know, just a lot of the infrastructure stuff that we tackled. Uh, also passed a bill to deal with uh, the not in my backyard type mentality for housing to make sure a new subdivision would be welcomed and able to come into a community and that communities couldn't change the rules midstream once a project was proposed. Uh, so I think just those three areas alone, I think we've made some monumental changes. Uh, I said at the beginning of the session, and it proved true that this was going to be the grand compromise session, and it really was. I, I think the first four years of Tony Evers as governor was a little bit of consternation between the executive branch and the legislature, and a lot of butting heads and throwing things at the governor just to dare him to veto it. I think we are obviously all going to have our policy issues that we're going to disagree on. There's still going to be plenty of vetoes, unfortunately. But... Uh, the people back home kind of said, hey, can you put some of that aside and actually get some bills done, get some laws signed into to action here, and get some, some things fixed for our communities. And I'm proud to say that all three of us, you know, really worked really hard to make sure that we could do that and deliver some, some good wins for Central Wisconsin and the state of Wisconsin as a whole. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Donna, anything to add? You, know, you, you touched on a few of yours, but anything to add? Um. It, it actually was an honor to be on Scott's Campaigns and Elections Committee. Uh, we had some very, very interesting interactions. Um, Representative Snodgrass and I got a, quite a bit of um, quite a bit of notoriety because of our willingness to work together. And um, you know, they, Mark Twain used to say, "Any amount of press that you get is good. Just make sure they spell your name right." So it was good that we did that. So I'm on the um, the Education and the, uh, Health Committee. I'm Vice Chair of the Health Committee, and I'm on the Education. We probably did a lot of bills for messaging. I mean, we do that sometimes. And uh, and we passed, one of the things that I was very proud of was our $50 million that we put into the reading program. You guys know that we have a horrible reading gap, especially among minorities. And so uh, we passed a $50 million reading uh, bill to put that money into trying to close that gap. If we don't have a literate society, we're in big trouble, you guys. And so, and, and girls, I'm sorry, and the generic. Um, so I feel very, very strongly about bringing up the reading skills. 
I'm also very proud of our shared revenue. You know, you guys know that I am on the Wood County Board of Supervisors. I think we have like five legislators now that are on their county boards. And we really appreciate that local government perspective that we take to the Capitol because it helps us, I think, identify more clearly some of the things that local government needs. So you need to know that you have a wonderful group of rural legislators down there that really fight the urban thought and and we do a good job down there in bringing up what we need in the rural communities I mean, we have people down there that don't believe that we ought to get transportation money they don't they don't understand why we need economic development money and we articulate those needs, I think, very well in order to bring dollars back to our local communities. The other thing, of course, we did was the Milwaukee Brewers package. And um, that, again, you don't want to watch the sausage being made on those kind of things. But we did end up with a package of that. And I think that that benefits all the states. Uh, there will be some decrease in your sales tax administration fee from that. So in addition to the shared revenue dollars, you'll get to keep more of your administrative uh, money for your um, sales tax revenue. So um, it, 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 w it was a good session. I had a couple bills. I don't know if you all know the governor was in Marshfield yesterday. You may have heard that. He came to talk about PFAS. Marshfield had some wells that tested positive for PFAS and uh, did some pretty creative things to uh, reopen those wells with a filtration system. So he came to Marshfield to tour that, and we met with him yesterday afternoon at the Marshfield Utilities and Electric, Electric Building. So that was a, an interesting thing, and it was interesting because I was taking some notes during that, and I just happened to reach in my pocketbook and pull out a pen, and it was one of his pens that I had gotten when he signed one of my bills. So I made a point to tell people that we do do things bipartisan, and here's the proof. I have a pen from the governor. So. But on the Senate side. Oh, they covered everything that we did. No, I'm just going to. Um, so th this session, I was really uh, fortunate. I was a member of the Joint Finance Committee. And um, what they don't tell you is that when you join the JFC Committee, your workload explodes exponentially and you become one of the most popular guys in the entire building because everyone's pounding down your door saying, money, 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 please. And I was really really proud of the budget that we crafted um, between negotiations between both houses. Uh, Scott and Donna both referenced the shared revenue reforms, which are monumental. I mean, this is an absolute game changer. Actually taking money out of Madison, sending it back to our local communities where government closest to the people can uh, uh, spend that money for key essential services. On the Finance Committee, I was actually responsible for our transportation budget, so when uh, Senator Markline, the Senate co-chair, called me to tell me what agencies I was going to be in charge of, his first um, first one was, well, Senator, uh, we're giving you DOT. I think my response to Howard was, what the heck did I ever do to you? <laughs> but, you know, I, initially I was, I was really, as we dove into it, I was really happy because um, this was one of these budgets where you saw a lot of investment going back to our rural communities. And Donna sort of touched on that, that that's often the biggest struggle that we face down in Madison. It's not Republican versus Democrat, it's often urban versus rural. And when <clears throat> you take a look at the composition of the Joint Finance Committee, we have a lot more rural legislators on that committee than we have in previous sessions. And so as a result of that, it made it a lot easier to get key investments coming back to things like the ABRA program, $150 million going for agricultural roads in our districts, $100 million going into the Elbert program, which is wildly popular, wild, wildly popular making sure that we have more local, um, our bridge, bridge and rehab, and say highway programs. I mean, we invested over $1.3 billion above what the governor proposed in, in transportation because we've heard it loud and clear that for years, as we've seen uh, money get diverted to these mega projects in southeastern Wisconsin, there was always these conversations back home that we were falling behind. And now we're at a point where we're actually catching up. And also in this budget, we hardly did any bonding whatsoever. We were using the one-time surplus, one-time cash to pay for projects and construction projects in our capital budget with money, not having to borrow. So when you take a look at all the projects that we funded and enumerated within the UW system, all paid for in cash. The only project that was bonded for in 
the budget was for the Blantnick Bridge up in uh, Superior and Duluth, which likely won't get enumerated for another couple budget cycles because there's some federal funds coming in with that. On top of that, and I, I know we got Scott Soik here who's from uh, Representative Van Orden's office, so please plug your ears, Scott. Uh, we did something novel that I don't think anyone out in D.C. would ever consider in this budget. We actually bought down debt. So we're setting up future budgets, future legislatures with what I would consider great success because when I first took office back in 2017, we are spending roughly about 20 cents on the dollar as it relates to bonding. We're dropping that down, it's now down to about 12, 12 cents on the dollar, which is actually a really good place to be in. I'd like to see a little bit lower, but on top of that, when you take a look at the other investments, record investments into our K-12 education system, on top of that, we were also have the largest expansion of the school choice program since the program's inception back in the early 90s. So proven that it's not a one, a uh, zero-sum game where you put money in one and not the other, we are able to fund priorities all across the board, even within our healthcare system. Major increases into reimbursements all across the board, especially in areas like for our long-term care, where we've seen a lot of pressure points. I mean, you name it, we, we really did a phenomenal job. Outside of that, some of the standalone bills that we worked on, I um, was really happy to see a, a bill for uh, the city of Stevens Point uh, pass for one of their kid districts to help with a potential new potato uh, processing company to come in at Bristol from Belgium who just last summer did a lot of test plots in the Central Sands growing a new yellow varietal potato that's never been grown in North America before that was wildly successful and if they do choose the Stevens Point location we're talking upwards of a 50 million dollar investment and 120 new jobs uh, some other bills that we worked on as it relates to health care, Donna sort of mentioned this, the Advanced Practice Registered Nurses Modernization Act. Uh, after a lot of back and forth and negotiating, um, you know, we had a bipartisan bill and, you know, last session the governor vetoed it. Uh, we're really hoping that this time he signs into law where essentially we're allowing our advanced practice registered nurses to operate at the highest level of the scope of practice, which Wisconsin is one of a handful of states that limits their, their practice currently. And in the wake of the pandemic, when we removed some of these restrictions, they delivered and quality of care did not diminish. On top of that, another bill that I was really happy to see that the governor had vetoed um, in a budget proposal a few sessions ago was dealing with uh, rural dentistry scholarships, making sure that we're getting more practitioners in underserved areas because over half of Wisconsin counties are dental deserts. And Primarily, it's not that we have a lack of dentists here in the state, it's where they're concentrated. And if we can get more of these students out in underserved areas and give them an incentive, provide that carrot approach, um, it's going to help in areas like Wood, like Adams, Juneau, Portage, which are all dental, dental deserts. And when you talk to many school administrators, the number, number one reason why kids miss school is because of toothaches, because they can't get to a dentist. And so I think this is going to go a long way. It's not going to solve all of our problems, but these are just some of the key areas that we've been focused on, and there's still plenty more work to be done. And that's why I'm happy to say I'm giving this another go and hoping to have another four terms down or another four years down in Madison. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to applaud you. I'm going to send a note to the governor. You are you have us absolutely two minutes early. So, so the next about 20 minutes or so is for you. <coughs> If you have any questions, I can, you know, this isn't, you don't have to raise your hand kind of thing, but I can recognize you. They are more than uh, welcome to um, answer your questions or try to answer them. So we're going to open up the floor right now. So anyone have any questions for our elected officials? Go for it. Maybe, a, well, uh, just for their, uh, why don't you just introduce yourself and move. Is there any movement towards that bill uh, progressing forward? I know 
the original bill, there's some restrictions in there that almost make it impossible for yeah. a private rural landowner to qualify for the program. Well, that's your own livestock. Right? I mean, that, that's the weirdest thing about the well comp program, the way it's set up right now, is that the, the, the changes we need to make to fund what's already been put in the state budget is a simple change, just saying, okay, you don't have to have these obscure requirements if you're in an area like, like I just inherited, right? I just picked up Northern Juneau County. Ground zero for this issue. So last day of our assembly session, I went up to the speaker and I said, hey, I, we just got done with maps trying to figure out th something to get done for my new district. First thing I want to do is I want to finish this well comp bill today. It's our last day. The Senate's already got it done. The Assembly's got to get it done. Unfortunately, it did not get passed in the State Assembly on its last day. Uh, the Speaker has issues with it. It's one of the arguments that <clears throat> Donna had mentioned before. When you've got rural legislators fighting for things that only pertain to the rural area, some urban legislators who sometime happen to be in leadership don't understand exactly what a private well is or does or how many we have or <laughs> or what the difference is between city wells and, and septics and sewer systems and so to try to have that abbreviated conversation with the speaker the last day was challenging and the bill did not get done but it is still number one priority because the rules in the current well compensation program absolutely make it impossible to take advantage of the money that we allocated in the state budget through the Joint Finance Committee that we had our, that we had agreement with with the governor's office. I mean, the money is there for the first time. Now it's just the darn rules we're going to fix. So I wish we had got it done the last day, but it didn't happen. So my apologies for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Other questions for officials? Go for it. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Tom Hughes, I'm one of the candidates for the mayor of Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, one of the topics that has just recently come up in the last 24 hours is the uh, Port Edwards Fire Department. Uh, can you explain how the shared revenue uh, bill would uh, would start ha helping those kind of uh, areas when they have volunteer fire departments um, that are underfunded and they're getting really upset? I mean, we're, that's kind of your district now, Scott. Um, oh, he's asking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I just was made aware of this literally as I was driving over here, the situation over Port Edwards, which is unfortunate. But, you know, this is one of the challenges that we've seen with especially our smaller departments that rely on heavily volunteers. Now, keep in mind, 93% of all fire departments here in the state of Wisconsin rely on volunteer firefighters either part-time or full-time. And so the goal is hopefully that with the shared revenue, because the, the whole <coughs> new formula going to shared revenue is, the, is to fund key and critical functions of local government. First responders, fire, EMS, infrastructure. And so what, what's unique about this and how it was set up and a major credit to Senator Felskowski and Representative Tony Kurtz who really got the ball started going in, starting um, in the fall of 2022 when they started these conversations and then it eventually snowballed where basically it was negotiated between leadership in both houses as well as the governor's office, is that what's unique about the formula change is that, one, the vast majority of townships here in the state of Wisconsin, um, we had some townships in, in our respective districts, that respective districts that are seeing upwards of 5,000% increases in shared revenue. Now on paper that seems like it's, you know, holy cow, that's a ton of money, but when you're only getting maybe a few hundred dollars from uh, the old formula under shared revenue, um, any new modification is gonna seem like a game changer. But what's unique too about this is that it's tied to the strength of our economy. So as revenues continue to grow and increase, well then uh, our local communities are gonna get more uh, shared revenue coming back to them. If we have an economic downturn, just like any of our household budgets, we're gonna have to tighten our belts. There's gonna be less money coming in. So really making sure that we're doing what we can to um, make sure governments live within their means, but then also rewarding them when, when times are good. And so the hope is, is that moving forward that there are gonna be more resources for these communities. So hopefully situations like what's happened in Port Edwards, which I don't have all the full, de full details on yet, which I'm gonna have to uh, make some calls on the way home, but uh, trying to figure out exactly where, where that pressure's coming from and. And uh, hopefully, with what some of the things that we've done, we'll, we'll provide some relief there. Yeah, maybe Scott. Yeah, so this is Scott's district. So. 
Yeah, as soon as things start to break, obviously, when you start seeing things pop up on your Facebook feed, you know things are getting real, right? So right away, as soon as I started seeing some of the things pop up on a couple of the early resignations from some guys I've known for 30 years out there. I have known these guys forever. Went to high school with them, graduated with them, worked with them, different places. Starting to see their angst and anger on Facebook yesterday, uh, was it was sad to try to figure out exactly what happened. And then to see the interim administrator put out an email like he did. It's absolutely unfortunate. I think that was the most critical misstep yesterday to say, okay, if you don't do exactly what I say, I'm gonna have the cops come get you, we're gonna transfer power and all this heavy handed type of stuff. So at that point, knowing it's a local issue, right? This is where we run into trouble sometimes. We, we get seen to be the kings and queens of our districts. It is a local issue. Really shouldn't have anything to do with the three of us besides the shared revenue side of it, which we did give them a 30% increase just going through the runs. I still feel an obligation sometimes to step in, right? If it's a local issue, I'm like, so okay. I called Betsy or talked to Betsy Mansell, the village president. Say, hey, I'm really sorry things are blowing up over there. Can you just kind of fill me in? If you want advice, I'm willing. If you want to have a conversation, I can. Uh, I don't you know, put my hand down and say, okay, I'm jumping in, I'm the state guy, I'm coming here to fix it. Not my job, first of all. So I want everybody to know we're not trying to take over any situations that happen. Uh, but second of all, to lend that advice and helping hand and helping here just to calm situations, I think that helped a lot yesterday. So as Betsy and I talked, just saying, okay, here's some of the things that I see. I don't know everything yet either. I haven't been to every village board meeting. I don't know exactly where all the problems are coming from, but I know you, Betsy and I know these guys. And I know, like I said, when we talked about campaigns and elections, I know that every situation has a solution. Period. Every situation has a solution. So it's just gonna be up to those individuals who resigned if they wanna come back and if there's some willingness on the village board to have the conversations and mediate and figure things out, we can get there. Uh, otherwise, I did relay the same message. Like, we went through the same thing with Brokaw when the paper mill closed up in Brokaw years ago. Uh, where the village has seen a, a bunch of additional costs and things got really tough and the services they always had were non-sustainable anymore. And I said, I don't think I don't think we're there yet, Betsy, on the point where, you know, I don't think we have to dissolve Port Edwards as a village, but I think people really have to understand the significance of what happened when the mill closed in 09 is that the services that have always been provided just can't still always be provided yet. So when you talk budgetary pressures, we have a lot less consumers of electric and power and water in Port Edwards on the industrial side that put that burden so much on, on the residents of the area. So I can see where the village is having problems with funding for the fire department and other key services because the consumer of the products that they have municipally just haven't been there the last 10 years. The wives closed and the mill's gone and, and all of these smaller things that people don't put into the bigger equation to say, okay, Maybe just because we've done it for 100 years doesn't mean we always have to do it for the next 100 years. So there's going to have to be some changes made in how those governments operate and governments across the state of Wisconsin. When their situations change, I want residents to be open to the idea that it doesn't always have to be the way it's always been. Thank you. Other questions for elected officials? So I want to switch gears a little bit. Why don't you introduce yourself? Just Former UW graduate. Uh, uh, so I had the pleasure of having lunch with the president of UW just as a month at UW South uh, recruiting there a couple weeks ago. And uh, one of the things he said was, took me aback because he said that Wisconsin <coughs> is ranked 42nd in the country now in revenue share uh, to the University of Wisconsin since when I was at college in Madison. I think third in kids were there, I think we were about the middle of the pack, and now we're near the bottom. It's unsustainable for families to try to send kids to college and do it without loading up with so much debt that, you know, they spend to their 50s trying to get out of that debt. Is there a plan to try to fix that formula in the state of Wisconsin? This used to be a bastion for education, and I'm worried that, you know, we're going to end up as a, not only a Medical 
So I'll take that first. Um, you know, we have a two-year campus in Marshfield. That certainly has undergone tremendous change since I've been there. I've been on the county board uh, for 24 years, and I have been heavily involved when it was the wood, and then uh, there was some restructuring. Now it's under UW-Stevens Point. We are worried about our campus closing, and so we are fighting very hard. I think there's two. There's a two-pronged answer to your question. One is financial, the other one is philosophical. You know that there has been a huge discussion in Madison about curriculum, about some of the things that there has been opposition to, the diversity, equity, and inclusivity uh, issue has been a huge issue that leadership in our caucus has been very vocal about, and the fear that we are indoctrinating students, not educating students. And so I think that that has played a huge part in supporting our universities financially. And I think we fixed some of that. Uh, we moved some of the DEI money into workforce development instead of hiring uh, people that um, just support the DEI. I'm going to give you a perfect example. Many of you know that I taught for UW-Eau Claire um, in the Marshfield campus at, in the <coughs> College of Nursing. Uh, taught for about 12 years there. And um, one day I was sitting at my desk, and the phone rang. And um, the person on the other line said, Professor Roser, and I said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? She said, well, I want you to know that you have been turned in by a student for using the word cotton picking in class. And I thought to myself, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm from the South. Everything is pea picking or cotton picking. It's just a cultural thing. So after I just ranted for about two and a half, and she said, this is Ann Smith from the Diversity, Inclusivity, um, Affirmative Action, Equity Office or something. And I thought, how, I wonder how much she makes. And um, so after, after I ranted for two and a half minutes and and said, there's not a racist bone in my body. You know, and this student obviously doesn't know her history. There were as many white people that picked cotton in the South than there were black people. And I, I just was livid about the whole thing. And so after that discussion, she said to me, well, I will let your dean know that we've had this conversation. I said, we haven't had a conversation. I ranted for two and a half minutes. And if you want to tell her that, that's fine. But that's the kind of stuff that people objected to. And you know, I went into snowflakes in the university and how sensitive we are and what a bunch of crap. So um, it, it, that's the kind of stuff that I think people were so objecting, they were objecting to that. And so we had huge discussions about this DEI thing and the finances from JFC were predicated on some of those discussions. I think some of that's been fixed. Um, the, the student debt is unconscionable as far as I'm concerned. Education has gotten so expensive. Why has education gotten so expensive? I think that there are root causes that we haven't even fleshed out about why in heaven's name it has to be so expensive to get a degree that doesn't give you the marketable skills to even make the money that you need to make to pay back the debt that you took to get out that degree. It is just absolutely ludicrous to me, and I think we need to delve more into the root causes, and that DEI situation was um, was discussed the last, and finances were tied pretty closely to that, so uh, that's my take on that, and I'm sure there are other takes. <laughs> so one of the challenges that we're facing right now as it relates to not just higher education here in the state, but even going into K-12, is that we have declined in enrollment because we have a demographic challenge where our birth replacement rates haven't been where they need to be since the 1970s. People are having less kids, they're having no kids, um, and they're starting to... I, I did my part. Yeah, Scott did his part. Uh, I have not. Um, but, I mean, that, that's really, it, it's created a, a ripple effect. And so I, I go back to, what was it, 2018 when then Chancellor Patterson facing a enrollment issue at UWSP. I mean, when I was at the university, I think enrollment was right just shy of about 10,000, but then it dipped significantly. And what that means, less dollars coming in through the door. So uh, back in 2018, Chancellor Patterson put out a bold proposal to try and reform 
the number of programs that were being proposed at the university because in some instances you had some of these programs where you maybe had one student enrolled. Now, when you factor in all the other added on costs that go along with that as far as administrative cost, faculty cost, well, then you have to ask yourself, does it make sense, am I going to continue to offer these programs where we have a limited number of individuals or do we try and tighten the belt and right size the ship? And so, unfortunately, back then, um, it, it got blown up and blew up in everyone's face and they had to kind of reverse course. But when you take a look at what other universities have done, UW Superior, basically, same situation. They were able to tighten their belt, uh, adjust the number of programs and curriculum that were available for students, and it was done in a manner to right size their ship. And so I think that needs to be a conversation moving forward, which is why I was happy to support the workforce development program that was put forward by UW System, because I think first and foremost, President Jay Rothman has done a phenomenal job. And I think his predecessor uh, did a phenomenal job. Both of them, in fact, Ray Cross as well as former Governor Tommy Thompson. But we have to understand that we can't continue to throw money into these systems unless there is an absolute need. And I think from the standpoint of the legislature is, we will fund the need. And right now, that need is in areas of high demand. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. That's why you've seen recent budgets too, that there's been an emphasis on funding our tech college systems because when you take a look at the jobs that are out there, it's in the trades. And people are smart. They can take a look at, okay, am I gonna go get a four-year college degree, come out with maybe fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 in debt, or am I gonna go to a two-year technical college where I can come out with half as much debt and start making a job that starts off at Eighty grand, hundred thousand dollars per year. So I think it's going to be an ongoing conversation that we need to need to address. But making sure that one, we are funding what needs to be funded, and those are the high demand fields right now. Because I'm a firm believer that our UW system should reflect the needs of the job market, and making sure there's a reason why we have 13 regional facilities is that they represent that region and should be helping and working with those employers in those regions to fill that, that talent pipeline that we so desperately need right now. So I've been on the college and universities committee my entire time in the legislature. So seven sessions I've served and I've seen the massive change in higher education from start to finish because we are more online learners than anything else right now because we've made credit transferability absolutely flawless. That you could take, uh, you could take a, enough credits here at MSTC to totally bypass the two-year uh, two UW system. And we have made things so flexible in education that we're making brick and mortar a little tougher to maintain. And I think what we get on the flip side of it is most of the system comes back and says, well, I need a building for this. Uh, do you? I mean, yes, the building's older, but do you have the students for it anymore? I mean, do we really make the students come onto campus and do all of these things that, you know, like I said about the Port Edwards thing, do we have to do it the way we've always done it? And I think that's the biggest change we've seen in education in my time in the legislature is that it is not so much sit here and learn, it's be out there and experience. And I think that's how we've changed the entirety of our education system to be more hands-on and more uh, real world application and experience. So it's going to hurt us in brick and mortar for the next 10 years. You're going to see private colleges, you know, the Cardinal Stritches and the Marians and, and you know, all of the, the, the private side is, is experienced the same thing as the public side. Just people aren't wanting to go to that brick and mortar experience anymore. And when they do, I would hope that our UW system would get back to their specialty areas. Like UW South was hospitality. Stevens Point was natural resources. I mean, everybody had their, their, their niche, right? And I wanted to make sure everybody stays in their niche areas instead of being all-inclusive, all for everybody, just so nobody has to leave home to go to school. It's not the best way to economically keep that system afloat. So we've got to get back to our specialties and not offer everything everywhere and kind of make sure that kids have to get out and experience a little, little bit. By the way, I'm so glad I have Nakusa. We're going to come visit Dom Tar and finally get into my new mill. So thank you guys for being here today. So I, I, I appreciate Seven. <coughs> uh, it's very, very difficult for employers as well to do this, that exact that program. 
And just think about the administrative support that those programs need. All of that is very expensive. And so if you can consolidate, especially with declining numbers, if you can consolidate those programs into one campus, make your job easier, then it also decreases the brick and mortar and the administrative costs to support those programs over seven campuses. Like, that was the big argument, is that UW-Madison was on our case the whole session. They wanted a $32 million engineering building, right? Like, okay, great. I get that you want an engineering building, but there is a perfectly great engineering program at UW-Platteville right now. That is not even at full capacity right now. So everybody wanting their own thing instead of understanding what already exists in the system is what's causing the problem that the money can't get into the classroom because I need a new building, even though one already exists 90 miles away. So I just... I'm trying to help people understand that, yes, when you see it on face value, it doesn't look great. But if you look at it from a 60,000-foot perspective, all the pieces are there. It's just going to take a little extra travel to get it done. Perfect. Let us uh, give our elected officials a round of applause. And, thank them. and as they say at the end of session, you are dismissed. Yeah. I think it's adjourned. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Now don't get me, I don't want Robert Voss, I actually know him, but I don't want him to call me and say you didn't do that correctly. So. At this point, I would like, uh, first of all, uh, thank all, any and all of you that are either in elected official uh, positions or are running for one, because we all know that's a difficult full-time job running for office, and uh, we thank you for that. We want to take just a couple minutes. Uh, you don't need to come up here or anything. If you are an elected official uh, or running for uh, an office, please uh, stand up, introduce yourself. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't have time for a big long speech. Sorry, but uh, we thank you for uh, that. So, however, you, however you want to do that. So, I think I've explained a little bit. Uh, I'm also on the ballot for county board. I'm running unopposed for another term on the Wood County Board, so I'm pleased I don't have to put the effort into to doing that. And then I will be a candidate in the new realigned 86th Assembly District, and I have given you the background of that and why I'm running. So, thank you. Thank you. Why don't we start right here? Okay. Thank you. And I am Katie Lee, and I'm the Public School Board. Garrett, I'm Wood County Treasurer, and I'll be up for election and then we'll ballot this time again. Appreciate you both. Okay, we'll jump here and then we'll. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lambert Cleveland, and I'm a legislator for the Wood County Treasurer. Welcome. I'm Julie Strand, and I'm on the ballot for the Pittsburgh School District. My name is Jeff Penn I'm a current Wood County Board Supervisor for District 11, and I'm a candidate for all the nine districts in Rapids District 4. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Zacker. I'm uh, Alderman District 3, Wisconsin Rapids, and I'm running for Mayor of Wisconsin Rapids. Go find me in Wood County Board of Wisconsin Rapids. And you already told your joke, so we're good, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't come along. My name is Todd Hughes, and I'm one of the candidates for Mayor of Wisconsin Rapids. Go for it. Go. Okay. Mr. Inda, um, thank them all for their <laughs> we do have our two candidates for uh, mayor of the city of Wisconsin Rapids so you get to sit at the, the big boy table up here Matt Zacker and Tom Muse and as they're coming up also I'd like to uh, uh, Senator Teston mentioned Scott Soik is here he represents Congressman Derek Van Orden and uh, thank you, Scott. And Scott was one that said if you have any uh, federal issues, he's more than willing to uh, spend time afterwards and chat with you. So thanks very much, Scott, for being here. 
So, okay. We will, um, if you want to just again introduce yourself and uh, we will have a couple questions and then we'll, again we'll open it up for anyone that has any questions for you. So uh, Matt, why don't you start us off? Thank you for having us here this morning. Uh, thank you to Mid State. Thank you for the Heart of Wisconsin. Thank you to the ladies who fixed breakfast for us this morning. It was excellent. Um, so my name is Matt Zacker. I was uh, born in New Berlin, Wisconsin. I went to high school at Waukesha Catholic Memorial. I, after the, after high school, I went in the military. I was in for just under four years. I served in the 101st Airborne. I went to Desert Storm for just under two years. After the military, I got out. I went to the UW-Milwaukee. Uh, I got my master's degree in social work, juvenile corrections. I worked in the juvenile correction field for multiple years in different positions. I ended up in a school social work in a schools in the inner city of Milwaukee. Uh, got married to my wife, Jenny, at that time. Uh, we had our first son, Martin. Uh, started looking for a place to live in that area. Ended up back here where Jenny grew up. And we had three more kids, uh, Lydia, Simon, and Vivian. And we've been raising them here for the last 18 years. Uh, I worked at, uh, or attempted to work in the social work field here. Um, but at the same time, I was able to work into buying into express recycling with my father and mother-in-law, Pat and Joe Kaziki, And that has um, been going on for 18 years. We're up to 12 employees now. We did buy them out. Uh, years ago, uh, so now it's my brother Tim and myself running that business, and working with them got me to the point now where, you know, I was able to talk with them and work through the finding out if I would be able to run uh, the city of Wisconsin Rapids full time because it's not an easy undertaking, of course, um, as well as running the business, um, and they all gave me the thumbs up. Uh, to be able to do this and take on this tax task. So I'm excited for it. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your time. Good morning. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Tom Hughes. Um, as Matt said, we're very thankful for all the um, hospitality that we've gotten over the last couple months here uh, running for Kansas uh, Everybody has been extremely nice um, and very flexible and understanding to us. Um, I'm a a lifelong member of Wisconsin Rapids. Um, my father worked in the beer and paper mill until retirement. Um, my mom worked in an, another cheese industry here in Wisconsin Rapids. Um, I have three siblings. Um, I'm the youngest of them all, so I'm kind of the baby of the family. Um, I also attended both private and public schools uh, here in Wisconsin Rapids. Graduated from Lincoln High School. And after high school, my intentions were to go to Universal Technical Institute, become a mechanic, and I, I couldn't fund it. Um, my mom um, was a single mom, and we just couldn't have the money. Um, obviously, I didn't have the credit score to be able to go to school, so I took the alternative and looked at the military. Um, my family had a long history of serving in the military. Um, I thought about just going like National Guard, something like that, but then. Uh, um, as I spoke to the recruiters, the Marine Corps recruiter seemed to be the best one. Uh, they offered the best programs that I was interested in mechanics uh, to become an a, a a aviation mechanic. Uh, so that's what I went off to San Diego to do. Uh, when I got there, um, the planes crashed, so the program got stopped. Um, so I became, uh, I was selected for Special Forces uh, because of my test scores. Um, so at that point I started working um, in security forces, which uh, worked at embassies, presidential guard, uh, silent drill teams, so on and so forth. So I've been around the world. Uh, first year I spent on uh, USS George Washington in the Gulf. Um, so the Kenya embassy bombings um, and also the attack on the coal, that was our battle group. So our, we were the reaction force to that. So we did a lot of, a lot of exercises with the Navy SEALs at that time um, at different embassies. I'm out of time, so we'll give it back to Matt here. One of the questions folks have is, uh, we, all, we talk about economic development, that's obviously a big issue for both the city and all the communities represented here. What are some things that, uh, if you are elected mayor, you could do maybe to foster uh, maybe a joint effort between uh, the other cities and the other villages and the townships around to maybe help grow the economic base here? So I, 
it, it's never been easy, but I, to be able to communicate with the surrounding communities. But I think, I think that now's the time to be able to. We have to do it. You know, we're going from one economy to a future economy that we're not even sure of what that's going to look like at this point. And I think we all know we're in the same boat. I've spent my life building, like learning how to communicate, learning how to listen, uh, and actually understand what people are saying, and then taking the time to find the middle ground between the groups of people that need to be able to communicate effectively and come up with ideas for the future that can actually help move things forward. And I'm gonna continue with those skills, building those skills, talking with the people, bringing people together. I've spent the last 18 years um, building their relationships and bringing <coughs> folks together, whether it's through business, through the Chamber of Commerce, through um, the people that we meet, uh, on, you know, through the kids at school, stuff like that. So it's been a great experience, and I know that I'm ready for the challenge to be able to bridge the gaps in communication and have those folks together so we can move forward. And what I take <coughs> in is like uh, building an entrepreneurial spirit in the community, working with the government entities, the schools that are there. All the organizations are there. We just need to bring together a stronger, more comprehensive entrepreneurial program to work towards the skills that we get either through college or we get through the trade programs and be able to see those and work together as a community to build those skills and build the economy from within. Obviously, as I've been speaking with our citizens and also businesses, I've been uh, I've been learning the entire way. Um, as a resident of Wisconsin Rapids, I know um, the situation that we're in. Uh, I also worked at the paper mill, so I am one of the displaced workers from that. Um, one of the biggest things that I believe that we're missing is industry, and we need to we need to make our families more wealthy. As simple as that. Uh, with inflating prices of our products, families are having a hard time uh, paying for things. Um, so to address some of the housing issues that we have here in Wisconsin Rapids and also the incomes of our families. Um, as a resident, I've already reached out to different companies that um, I think would be a good fit for Wisconsin Rapids um, and in the surrounding areas. And I've actually got a response back from these industries that would have given stipulations basically saying that they would come to Wisconsin Rapids if this happened. Um, if I can do that as a resident, um, I can just imagine what I can do as a mayor. So that is my main focus, um, is to get things that we have now kind of corrected, remove some of the restrictions, um, to bring in more industry and look out for our citizens. Um, As an outsider, as not being a politician, to put it that way, as a, as a citizen running to represent the citizens, I don't have the inside uh, connections as maybe some of you have after serving for a very long time. Uh, but I believe that Central Wisconsin has a very unique situation. Uh, we can learn from communities like Brokaw, Whiting, Port Edwards. We know what's actually coming. We know that we are at the top of our economy right now to where it's only going to get worse. Um, so with that, I would like to address some of those things to prepare for the future, and I believe we have enough information to do that. We'll just, uh, if you want to just keep that right there, um, you did mention a little bit about affordable housing. Are you hearing that out on the trail? or what? And maybe there's some ideas you have. But we'll, both of you will get a chance to, to answer, but on affordable housing? Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> I've kind of taken the hot seat with that. Um, because the solutions that I have doesn't necessarily make um, profits for some of the individuals. So um, Matt and I just uh, had a visit with the local landlords association. I knew walking into that meeting some of the proposals that I would have would not be very popular. Um, I also um, kept track of what happened with the housing summit here at Minnesota Tech last week. Our community has a very aging infrastructure of homes. We do have some newer apartment structures, but for the most part, some of our older homes are actually owned by the landlords. And because it's an investment opportunity for the landlords, they'll purchase the properties either uh, from a family that maybe the individual uh, has deceased, um, 
and the family just doesn't want the house, or if it's a bank repo, they're buying the properties at a very low amount as an investment opportunity. They turn around and stick the money into it to get it ready for somebody, for a tenant to take this place, and their overhead costs to run that property continually go up and they transfer it off onto uh, to the tenants. When the tenants aren't making any additional money because we don't have quality paying jobs here in town. I am, as a citizen, I believe that the American dream, as Scott had mentioned earlier, uh, for individuals to be able to own a home. Um, we do have affordable housing, depending on the way you look at it. If we take some of our rental properties that are having increased rent charges on the tenants, if we could get more of those homes actually available to individuals to, uh, to actually purchase, I believe we do have affordable housing. Our, you can look at our population. Population of Wisconsin Rapids hasn't really changed over the last 20 years. So what is what's missing? We have the same houses. So that's the that's uh, the take I put on it. Thank you. Yeah, same question. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> market forces. I mean, we don't we don't necessarily get to dictate what. It's not. We don't just come up with numbers. I am a landlord. I've been in business, you know, except like for 18 years. Everything's driven by market forces, so we don't necessarily have the opportunity to just tell people, you, you charge this, you pay this, and, and uh, I get to dictate all that stuff to you guys. It comes down to what's available for the price and how that's going to play out in the long run. And, uh, and now with the, you know, the cost of goods so high and the cost of labor so high, like everything's changed and we're all in the same boat. Um, affordable housing, to my understanding, uh, what we can do on a, on a municipal level, city level, is to work our way through the ordinances, the codes, and the zoning. We've, we've, enact, we've, we've voted on putting all this, our own legislation on ourselves, our own regulations, and, and I think it, when it's done, I think it, it looks good, but when it's taken to the real world and tried to put into effect, it, everything changes. And, and now we, excuse me, now we have to deal with undoing some of those. We've got to go through all the ordinances, codes, zoning, go through it, bring it down to a level that actually makes sense so that, so that the people that are in the community, the workers, the business owners, all those folks can make the stuff happen. The, the city doesn't make the economy grow. The people in the city make the economy grow, and we need to release the burdens that we've kind of put on them in order to be able to free that up to make that happen. And the faster that can move, and as the costs start coming down and getting in line, it's going to take a few more years, I would assume, to figure out exactly what's going to go on with pricing all across the board. Those things have to be set in place to be able to let the people of the community run their businesses, work their jobs, make their money, and the money will figure itself out over time. Thank you. Since the mic is there, we'll start there. Um, everyone that runs for a position, whether it be school board or whatever, you want to you want to be known. At least I think you want to be known as someone that that is very easy to work with or cooperative. Is um, the city of Wisconsin Rapids easy for people to do business in? And if so, great. If not, are there things that you may be able to do to kind of help that? I mean. I don't mean just business, but even, even citizens, that kind of thing. If you want to be interested to hear your comments. Well, I think this is one of the bigger parts, you know, of my platform. Um, and it's, it's not going to be easy, but it goes back to the first question, which is building relationships and being able to communicate effectively with people. And right now what's happening is, in my opinion, the city, the city there's a gap between the city employees and the, and the residents and the businesses. And it's not that anybody's ill will, it's just, sometimes it's just a different in their upbringing, their intellect, their ability to communicate on the level that, you know, that needs to be in order to get things done. And again, that comes down to the zoning and the codes, because it, cause if, if the city's answer is, I'm sorry, it's in the book. So if it's in the book, there's nothing we can do about it. So then it's got to go all the way to the aldermen in order to get the, the book passed, uh, you know, changed, and that's going to take, you know, hopefully we're trying to change it from two months of readings to one month so we can make changes quicker to be able to get to the point where the people in the city can say I can make it happen like it has to be customer service based 
It has to be run more like a business, not just we dictate to you what you can do and everybody's angry at each other because nothing's getting done. We need to be able to get things done faster. It's going to come down to communication, treating each other well, and I can help do that, uh, just bridge those gaps and get more into the to the business side of what we're here to do as a municipal corporation and run it, run it well for the community and the citizens. Okay, Tom. It's no secret that obviously since uh, announcing my candidacy, um, I've been reaching out to other communities. I've talked to area contractors, I've talked to area schools, um, reached out to out of the area, even out of the state of Wisconsin, to talk to different businesses. And throughout all of that, anybody that's aware of Wisconsin Rapids, they said in order to even be interested in Wisconsin Rapids, we would have to remove some of the city policies, including some of the individuals that we have in our city administration. Um, obviously, I don't want to name all individual names, but there's, there's individuals that have come to our community, are working here, that have come from other communities. And those communities removed them from office, and now they're working for Wisconsin Rapids. <laughs> Our purpose that we have from our city administration is to adapt and represent our citizens and bring businesses in that they can work at. When businesses will not come here because they have a pre-representation, a pre-idea of what they're walking into, we can't. Even local businesses that we have now are leaving because of some of the policies, ordinances that our local government has put into place. Every single business that, that I've spoken with, Every single contractor that I've spoken with, the landlords that are leaving the areas and selling their properties in the areas, a few names keep coming up. And it's one of those circumstances where I can't just necessarily go in and be bullheaded and just constantly remove people, but we need to have people in positions of authority within City Hall uh, that can answer the questions and also remember that the platform I'm running on is actually the Constitution. Um, our citizens are being infringed upon by our own government. We need to remove that stuff. We need to remove the ordinances. They're inflecting on our people from actually having their own liberty. That amount of time. Okay, uh, it's your turn. You don't necessarily have to reside in the city of Wisconsin Rapids to ask a question or have a concern, voice a concern. Obviously, this is one region here, so they are most kind and generous to answer any questions you may have. So we'll just open the floor. Well, as a member of the school board here of directed or anybody specific or both of us? No, you both, both can okay. um, I'm not married, but I've been with the same gal for 10 years. We have uh, three children together. She's actually a, a registered nurse at Marshall Hospital in pediatrics. Um, so I'm very aware of what's happening with our youth um, that need services from the clinic. Um, I also have been part of a group that has supported some of our area public or uh, school board members, uh, Chris, um, Mike, and also Julie. In the past, um, I started my three younger children in the private school system, and now my oldest is at Lincoln High School. Um, obviously, as a graduate from Lincoln High School, I know that there's some challenges out there. A lot of it was brought on um, during the Walker administration with the um, with the teachers union. A lot of those individuals either took early retirement. We lost a lot of experience within the teachers. The other thing that is affecting our 
mental capacity here in Wisconsin Rapids is that our families are literally living in poverty. More of them are working more hours at different jobs, whether they have two or three, and the children have less parental guidance at home. Some of the social experiments that are going on right now with Furbies or litter boxes in schools are unacceptable. Okay, this is from my citizen's point of view. And as a resident, okay, I have a student in the high school and I know exactly what she has been seeing. Right, and we also have sixth graders. We also have sixth graders having intercourse and being caught at the junior high level. Also not true. Okay. This is exactly what I know. If this is wrong, then we need to have this communication put out there. Who is actually sharing this information with anybody? This is the information that the residents of Wisconsin Rapids and Wood County are aware of. Yeah. These are the concerns. I hear somebody else. I will, I will put myself out there because I will fight for our residents. If it is untrue, I will listen to you. Have you ever called me, Tom? Yes, as a matter of fact, two years ago when you sent out the flyers to contact you, I did call, and the numbers that you gave me were incorrect. <laughs> so for those who do know me, over the last uh, 18 years, I guess, 15 cents chamber, I started getting this, you know, in my head. It's always, it's always been about bringing everybody together, like all the organizations in our community, and, and have a comprehensive... I guess I always figured it was more of an entrepreneurial platform, an entrepreneurial spirit built. And, um, and I am learning more and more through the county right now and their efforts with the entrepreneurial ecosystem, uh, talking with Jamie White, who's a great entrepreneur in the community, and just understanding the big picture of what's already happening in, in other communities. And it's what I want to focus on helping bring here, which is, like in my opinion, we have, and again, this. This is out there, so I just had three kids. I have one that just graduated from Lincoln, one that's going to this year, one that's coming up next year, and a 12-year-old. And they all did really well. But they all did really well because they have the support system in order to give them the tools in order to do that and, and then translate that into school when they're there. But let's just say 50% of the people that are going through our school system, of the kids going through, are understand what college is about, what it's for, and have the passion and motivation to, to take on those challenges and those, that competition. But the other 50% kind of know from the get-go, and their parents know, and, and we know, who's, they're not, they don't, I hate to say it, they just don't have a, sh a shot, right? So I think those kids are the ones who are frustrated, angry, they don't have a support system at home maybe, they don't have the tools, uh, to be able to handle life as it is right now. So I think a new program that can be designed, and again, I don't know how this works because I understand that we don't just snap our fingers and change the educational system, and if that starts at federal level to the state level and comes down to our community, but something needs to be done to give that 50% of the kids um, that hope, the critical thinking skills, the, the tools <laughs> to be able to use their hands, use their ingenuity in a way that makes them have pride and feel good. And then from there, they move into the future and hopefully can change some of those cycles and break the cycle of some of the things that are happening at home that we can't control. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? Um, right here and then you'll be next, next to you and then you. So. I'm Julie Strand. I'm the president of OPC. And just wondering what your thoughts are in collaboration and partnership um, from individuals with disabilities in the community as well as individuals that um, are struggling with mental health and how you could see a nonprofit, a huge nonprofit like OBC in your community partnering, what those partnerships could look like and what you see the city or um, what would you continue or change in the future to continue with strong partnerships in that way? So through Express Recycling, we've been working with ODC, again, for probably 16 years or so, on and off, depending on how, obviously, with the situation, we've had great success with having people come in and, and do jobs uh, for short times and, and just building that real-world experience, and I think that that's great. 
So I think to continue um, working with businesses that can allow those um, individuals to come in and, and, and build that confidence and, and enjoy that interaction with the community as it stands, I think that that's um, great. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure on a nonprofit level, like I know, I don't know all the details as to how things change. Like ODC had a lot of fantastic jobs in the building for a long time and we helped with the recycling efforts and, and uh, did what we could to, to provide those opportunities for, for those uh, individuals. But now I, my understanding is the programs have wanted, again, if I'm speaking out of line, I apologize, but they want them to go more out into the community and, and, and have that experience and, and grow that independence. And I, I think that that's very valuable and I see that in the experiences we had and I would support any efforts by any private companies or nonprofits that have work for them to be able to do. I think it's an amazing experience. Tom. Uh, yes, uh, I think it's very important. Um, ODC and also other businesses in the area that have employed or set up programs uh, for our, some of our challenged individuals, it's excellent. Um, obviously, I believe that every single citizen deserves a, some kind of a chance. Um, we're going to do the maximum we possibly can with our God-given talents. Uh, some individuals are obviously challenged, but I do not necessarily look down on these individuals. Um, I would like to incorporate them even more. Um, even reaching out to ODC, and I believe uh, you'll have to correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, connected to ODC is the HOPE organization. Um, I reached out to them and I'm impressed. Um, businesses like Goodwill and McDonald's are also employing them. Businesses are making it available that they can have some kind of lifestyle. I think that's excellent. I would do everything I could possibly can to support those um, organizations, whether it be nonprofits, city programs, um, private entities. Um, I also believe in parent organizations, so PTOs or PTAs, um, helping some of our, our challenged youth at the schools. Uh, yesterday I reached out to one of the uh, school board members that is the, um, I believe is the president of the Head Start program. Uh, he himself has a couple of kids that are, are challenged. Again, everything that is going on with our public school systems and from our city um, administration should be looking at taking care of everybody equally. And if somebody else needs additional assistance um, to adapt or to adjust to their needs, I'm all for it. Um, so ODC has been a very good um, addition to our community for a very long time. Um, I've had some neighbors, um, I don't know if you remember Clarence or not, he was around a long, long time ago, he was my neighbor. Um, also know Mr. Dillingham that works at McDonald's, I graduated school with him um, to this day. Uh, obviously I see him and he knows me by name. Um, if there's anything I can do to improve on his lifestyle uh, through affordable housing, um, greater incomes, and also programs like ODC are excellent. Um, I have nothing negative to say about them. Anything that we can do to increase those kind of programs, I would, I would definitely be interested in working with that. Thank you. Kim Grover, Nexco Partners, uh, admin of the Positively Wisconsin Rapids page. Extremely important to me, positivity in this community. I think it is hard to find at some, uh, in many areas. What is your plan to not only move our city forward, but to do it in a positive manner. Not saying you have to be Pollyanna, but let's keep moving forward positively. What's your plan to do that? Since I got the mic, I'll go first. Obviously the platform that I'm on, Constitution. Um, a lot of our divide in our community and also in our government is political. It's one party against the other. Um, I believe we can just get rid of the parties. I believe uh, a lot of our answers uh, and uh, resolutions that we can have to the issues we have today is turning back and looking at our Constitution. We have old, almost 250 years of experience. A former, former fathers of our country that have dealt with this. Our Bill of Rights instruct exactly what we can do to address some of the issues. Because we have decided to look at the different issues from political standpoints, we're constantly moving farther and farther away from the actual Constitution. Um, so, Understand that there is a divide. There is a misunderstanding between different parties and different organizations here in Wisconsin Rapids. We also have to look at our communication. Where are people getting their information from? <coughs> Obviously, any of you know that I'm all over Facebook. 
I love to talk. Well, when I've reached out to other individuals and listened to them, I see different points of view because they are getting information from one different source, whether it be Newsmax or CNN. They're not getting the truth. So looking at different communication efforts here in Wisconsin Rapids, including the public. So for some of us, um, obviously as mayor, we're going to be depending on the council to talk to their constituents. One of the proposals I would have is actually a mayor's public advisory commission where I would actually use a lot of money that I'm getting uh, to pay some of our citizens to come in and share their opinions. And through that communication, hopefully something, some of the issues that we might not understand or say that are untrue can be addressed. Instead of having to go through the whole political system, it can be very direct from the mayor's office. I believe, um, I believe we have everything set up in place already. We've been running these institutions for a long time. We have aldermen, which are paid people from the community to talk to the people, to come in and talk to the mayor and bridge those gaps. That's the whole point. And they're elected by the people in order to do that job. Now, if we don't like them, then we should vote in new people and let them do the same job. But ultimately, that is their job. I believe that this just, you know, the Constitution is one thing, but human nature is a whole different thing. And that's what the whole Constitution, in my opinion, was trying to do, is to give us a sound platform to be able to have the human nature factor not always take control and go crazy. Um, but in the, in the meantime, it's up to us as individuals to be able to communicate effectively and find common ground between the two sides if that exists. Because what I've seen is, yeah, there's some, let's just say, extreme people on both sides, but most of the people are in the middle that I meet anyways in my life. They're, you know, they're common sense thinking, they want the best for their families, they want to be able to just, you know, run their lives and keep the government out of their way as much as possible, but yet we have to take care of business at the same time in order to run our communities. So, to me it's all about being able to communicate effectively, listen, understand where they're coming from, and bridge those gaps. Not everybody has the ability to do that all the time, but to me, that is my job. I'm not doing this for my benefit. I'm doing this for the benefit of the community and to help everybody else reach their goals and reach their dreams so that, you know, if they're doing that, we're going to uplift our community because that's what our community is. It's the people. So, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Go for it. Cole McKissie here with the Insurance Center. Um, in lieu of the last budget season, um, there was a lot of talks about um, cutting or eliminating a lot of nonprofit um, connections with the city. Um, what are your guys' stance on it, and what is your plan moving forward as a mayor if you're elected? So, um, I've been on the finance and property as chair for two years. Um, I don't, I haven't really made, you know, I, it's easy to talk about, you know, figuring out how to get new construction, new street construction within the operating budget so that we're not taking out debt every year in order to keep our infrastructure in place. But at the same time, we need to keep our infrastructure in place. We already complain about the roads. I know that's the n number one complaint that I usually get from people. And we do the best that we can given the circumstances because it is so expensive, about $2 million to do about one mile of road. Um, but the budget itself, it, we do need to dive into it. And as an alderman, you don't, they say, you know, you're in control of the money, but you're really in control of what they tell you about the money because it's, you're only there for a few hours a week, so you can't really dive into the budget 100% to figure out what's going in the departments, going on in the departments, and everything that goes into it. So I am going to take the time to, if I get elected, I'm going to take the time to dive into each department, figure out if there's a way to do, you know, best practices, uh, kind of like the, the, you know, we were talking about at the state level, like, if, if we're over budget, we have to try to fix it. We can't just keep going like we're the same community we were a year, three years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We're not, we're not the same community. And there's a personality change that's happening. And part of that is going to make sure that we get that money under control so that we are as sound as possible as we move through these transitions as a city and figure out that new economy from within. But it's very doable. 
And again, I don't have all the answers yet, but I'm gonna, you know, working full time plus, I'm gonna have the time to dive into that and figure this out. All right, I guess there's another topic I'm not gonna be very popular with. Uh, actually, I believe uh, nonprofit organizations um, are their own entity. And when it comes to taxpayer dollars funding, um, we have to basically look at if we're getting the best bang for the buck. Um, every citizen that I've spoken with and every business that I've spoken with, um, they said we need to be accountable with the tax dollars. From the business aspect, um, majority, not all, but majority of the businesses that I've spoken with are not part of the Chamber of Commerce. And they have given me all kinds of different reasons why. Um, I realize that the Chamber is doing as much as they possibly can. I really do. I appreciate it. I've seen what's going on. I know how they're marketing four different business programs like this. Um, the Downtown River uh, Luncheon, excellent things. Uh, but our local businesses don't feel like they're being represented from the Chamber of Commerce. Now my direction is that instead of having a nonprofit or taxpayer money going to advertise businesses, those are actually some private entities that could take over in those areas. Um, marketing, if you go to um, any kind of professional marketer, they're gonna get your name out much farther. Um, we use LinkedIn, Facebook, stuff like that. Um, I do have experience marketing on a national level for the American Hot Rod Association. Um, YouTube has a much larger reach. I can put a video that uh, doesn't have very much interesting stuff on there. Um, name out just one brand, for instance, I can put something up there for a deodorant. And I'm reaching 10,000 people. Um, here in the area, people don't understand or don't hear about what's going on in the area because it's not advertised, it's not being marketed. And some of our local businesses don't feel like they're being marketed well enough. Um, so I'd be interested in looking at private uh, parties that could actually take over with that. You speak on marketing and advertising and you'd like to defund the chamber and I'm guessing CDB. Did you realize that that is not funded by tax dollars? That's actually funded by room tax and the city is legally obligated to give 70% of the dollars to a, a convention and visitors bureau and then the remaining 30% are allocated to parks and recs department a small portion to the chamber and so on, but that is not taxpayer dollars. Um, as far as the money that the chamber raises for yourselves, no, that's not taxpayer dollars. I'm not talking about the money that we raise for ourselves. I'm talking about the partnership we have with the city. Right, so the partnership you have with the city, I believe in this budget season it was $25,000 that you were asking for. Um, that is taxpayer dollars. It the is city not. administration does not make money. It is it not is taxpayer, all dollars. taxpayer dollars. It is room tax dollars room from tax. hotels. That is still It is taxpayer not taxpayer dollars. dollars. It is not. It's, it's funded by, 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 by visitors that stay at hotels. It's called the hotel tax dollars. Right. Yeah, so it is, it is funded by those that use the service. Unless you stay at a hotel, it's not funded by the and it's not individual property owners or income taxes, but it is still a tax. Now, I'm not saying to take that completely, say just defund you completely. What I'm saying is that we need to be accountable for every dollar. So if we're spending that money, are we getting back the, the best performance out of that dollar spent? Um, if it's a performance evaluation. If we're spending $100,000 on this program, but it's only attributing $10,000 of value, it's a liability, it is not an asset. We have to look across every program that is going on within the city administration. If we're using taxpayer or any funds in any means to the best of their ability. Talking uh, earlier when I asked the question about the shared revenue, um, we're continuing to add additional funds to our city budget through the shared revenue system, but we're not keeping up to the, the maintenance that we have. Our uh, road construction, it's a big deal, but can we actually fix all the roads that we have going on in town and are deteriorating? We're never going to keep up. No matter how much money we get, we're not going to be able to keep up with that demand. Local, local nonprofits, including yourself and also the Visitors Bureau, I've spoken with them. I've actually approached you multiple different times as a small business owner and also event planners with this different kind of stuff. I've been turned away. I have not gotten the assistance. So again, I can't, from my experience as a small business owner, I cannot necessarily move into the position of mayor and put my faith in programs like that when the reach 
I'm sorry, I'm a citizen. I'm not part of this group that is talking with the different organizations. But I've met with you. I've met with you and talked to you about yes. your business. So I just want to make clear that some of that is not accurate information, as well as, again, like saying if you're going to go into the budget on the CVB and the chamber, the city doesn't have the right to do that because literally 70% has to legally go to the CVB. So there's no, you can't really say anything for it because it has to go. Sure, you can say stuff about us, Chamber, that's fine. But for the CVB, for marketing and advertising, for visitors, legally you have to. Okay, so let's give you an example. For a smaller village, say like Rudolph, are they required to give 70% of their money to you? No. Hotel room tax. Right. So if any small town, um, let's use Millsville, the Millsville High Grounds. For instance, do their hotel tax, is it mandatory that they pay it out to their Chamber of Commerce? It's not Chamber of Commerce. I'm telling you, that is not Chamber of Commerce. That is the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Meredith would be able to answer it's that. A, it's a tourism entity defined by state statutes. So not every um, state has a different tax Excuse me, but I have spoken. I have spoken with you multiple different times, also. Um, in those conversations, you expressed the concern of how much funding you have, to the point where um, you even had to shut down your um, merchandise store on the back side there. Um, well, no, that was well, that was that was actually due to the pandemic because you know, when we shut down, it was right? So, um, so that was that was more that that was a. I mean, with that, obviously the question was directed, what I would do different. As a citizen, as a citizen representative, I'm almost 50 years old. In that, in that time, be a small business owner, being active within the area, going to different activities, it wasn't until I actually went through the city budget communications last year at City Hall that I was even aware of either one of your organizations. When I reached out to small businesses that I'm just associated with, they don't have necessarily a good um, rapport on local government and local advertising. That's the truth. That is not only my opinion, uh, because I only own some, two small little things. I'm not a big corporation. It is the established businesses here in Wisconsin Rapids. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking for Matt with his business. I, I don't know his finances or anything like that. But the other companies that I've spoken with, they have the doubt. And again, when it comes to anything that comes from the mayor's office, I'm a civil servant. I'm representing the people, not the nonprofit organizations. I'm sorry. That is, if I have to stand behind that, I'm going to stand behind that. If that's what our voting population and citizens need, that's where I stand. I will be, I would be willing to stand up against anybody that is against that or um, looking to take advantage of that. That's what I believe we need something different within a mayor's position. That's what the people want. They want change. That's the change they want. That's what I represent. If it comes to in a couple of weeks to the spring election, that will tell you what our city actually wants. Yes. Obviously, the biggest one that's up in the city right now is the issue. 
not the most fun one to talk about, but I think it's good for you guys to describe exactly the reactions you're getting from people when you're talking to them, uh, what, the, what the plan moving forward would be if referendums passed, if we got the referendum that was passed. I just wanted to get some info on that because that's one of the things we get most of the people in our office. They ask us about each of these things, and that's what we have to try to describe. Um, we go first since the mic is here, if that's okay with Matt. Um, yes, um, actually the Facebook group, um, Wisconsin Rapids UTV ATV, um, I actually kind of started that group about two years ago. Uh, it was kind of falling on its face. I allowed some uh, other individuals to moderate the group and it's exploded ever since then. Um, they have taken over and done all the footwork to bring that up. Um, <laughs> Obviously, as a lifelong resident of Wisconsin Rapids, I have been riding ATVs, motorcycles, um, as young as four years old. My kids, um, all three of my kids have ridden a four-wheeler, um, are getting into motorcycles now at the ages of five. And we do ride on the street in front of our home. Um, I'm also aware that, you know, when I was growing up, we would ride snowmobiles from Rudolph and go all the way up to the UP, and we never once had a trailer thing anywhere. I ran into Senators uh, Teston and Krug at the library before all of this kind of went down in November. Um, Scott actually said, like, if I want to get elected, don't even take sides on this. Um, I believe, again, under the constitutional platform, it is the right of all of us to use some of our public space. And because other communities around Wisconsin are seeing the benefits of UTV, ATV road usage in their communities, to me it's a no-brainer. Um, we talk about the, the economy and the revenue here in Wisconsin Rapids. Instead of just adapting the road usage, we should look at capitalizing on it. We're centrally located in Wisconsin. What can we do to attract um, UTV, ATV groups that are in Eau Claire to Wisconsin Rapids. What can we do to attract UTV, ATV business to Wisconsin Rapids from Fond du Lac? We need to capitalize on this adventure. Um, I'm hoping that it passes in November, um, so I'm for it, and that's the biggest thing that I've taken out of it. I'm going to give Maddie Palmquist and Brian Marsh the credit for bringing that forward and doing what they've done to get it this far because they worked hard and they're really smart and I hope you know whatever capacity they serve in the community they keep doing it because they're good they did a good job with it um, for me I was in the position as aldermen to have to vote on it uh, I took the stance and this is all for better or for worse I mean if I could redo it again I don't, I don't know if I would choose differently or not but in the beginning we said let's we wanted more people to know about it because we knew they came in like, and again, this is all my opinion, so I'm not trying to make anybody angry, but they came in pretty pretty fast. They knew what they were doing. It was, you know, like it's, they're working to get this passed through, the, as far as I can see, the entire state, and it's going to be here eventually, so I'm not really worried about that. What I was concerned about was the people in Wisconsin Rapids having no idea what was going on, and then we were asked to vote just like that to make them okay to, to drive on the streets, and then the next day they would have all, well, soon enough they would have all been there. And I, we have no idea what it's gonna look like. Is it five, is it 500? You know, we don't know. Personally, you know, if I could ever save up that kind of money, I, I'd probably buy one if we can do it. And uh, it, I think it would be fun. But, so we, we passed to, to send it to rep, uh, referendum, it got rescinded, and then, so then we voted it down because then it put the, the burden on the group that wanted it to get the signatures to take it to referendum. And so at the time of them getting all the signatures, in my opinion, they had done a great job. They got a lot of people, not just the people that signed, but the people that were talked about it. So it, it really went through the community. At that point in time, I was contemplating voting it through, except for then the, the nomination, the papers, they created a new, um, they created a new ordinance and, hold on, I, they created a new <laughs> ordinance and and uh, they said uh, in that it was from 12 to, 15, 12 to 15 years old. And so then we decided, well, that should be voted on by the residents. If we're gonna have 
young kids on the roads uh, with semi trucks. We should let the people decide. So I, if it goes through a referendum and it passes, I support it 100%. If it doesn't uh, pass, then they're welcome to bring it back again with the old ordinance, and we'll see what happens. <coughs> so thank you. One final quick question. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for your attendance. I especially want to thank uh, candidates, folks running for mayor, our elected officials. Uh, if your name is Pat, Donna, or Scott, and you uh, spent some of your time in Madison, before you go out and uh, put that sign up, you are uh, invited to a listening session, short listening session of the state. Today. Not today. Uh, not, not, not this time. Nope. Not this time. time. Okay. Nope. So if any of you have any questions, <laughs> uh, if any of you have any questions for the legislators, though, I'm sure that they would be happy to answer. Or if you those. have uh, questions for from the federal level, that gentleman can help you. We really need to thank uh, Enbridge, thank Domtar, Ochuck Gaming and Nakusa, thank you, Mid-State Technical College, you're the awesome host every time, U.S. Bank, thank you very much, and J.H. Pindorf and Son, thank you. You're easy to see because you've got a nice great red shirt on. <laughs> we couldn't do this without you. We'd like to thank Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. Thank you so much. It will be on both Solaris and Spectrum. Spectrum yep. probably within the next couple of days. By the end of next week it should be up, next yep. Week, okay. And also Kathy, thank you, uh, Chatterbox for the catering. And thank everyone and have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. And uh, I think you're gonna go Craig. to the table. Oh, I'm sorry. Go for it. We have to thank Greg for being here. He's leaving us, and he's done a great job while he's been here. Oh, let us see. One of the three Craigs on the uh, part of Wisconsin Chambers. Completely unnecessary, but I really appreciate it. I've had a great time with the seven years of that. Well, I appreciate the 20 bucks you gave me. Oh, you were not supposed to share that. <laughs> and, uh, I think your tie is indicating there's some kind of holiday coming up, maybe on Sunday. Again, sincerely, thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. Take care.